And now a, a scripture that we have become familiar with from Isaiah 35. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackal shall become a swamp. The grass be shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there and it shall be called the holy way the unclean will not travel on it but it shall be for god's people no traveler not even fools will go astray no lion shall be there nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it they shall not be found there but the redeemed shall walk there and the ransomed of the lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Friends, my name is Jennifer Barchi. I am the pastor of Dickey Memorial Presbyterian Church, which is on the very far west side of the city. And in that, this city, we do make that distinction between West and Outer West Baltimore. Um, last night, I asked my wife, you know, as you do, if there was anything that she th sh thought was really important that I should tell you. And she said, well, it might be worth noting to, to the congregation that you usually preach to a congregation of about 30, <laughs> which is true. I usually preach to 35, 45 on a really good day. And so I approach, I approach preaching as a conversation, an intimate conversation. And I don't know about you, but I've never had an intimate conversation with 650 people before. But we're going to try it tonight. When I was in high school, my best friend had a morbid fascination with death. To be more specific, she was particularly enthralled by the stories of death and near-death experiences of those people who had the misfortune of getting lost in the wilderness. She had an entire bookshelf that was lined with titles like Death in the Grand Canyon, Death in the National Parks, and then the very generic Death in the Wilderness. And you know, when I was bored, I was at her house a lot, I would pick up one of these books and I would start thumbing through the pages and these books made one thing abundantly clear. They made it clear that if you found yourself in a wilderness situation, then you had two options. You were either going to get creative and you were going to live, or you were going to become terrified and you were going to die. I did not like these books. I did not like these books because I knew one thing about myself very clearly. I was in the get terrified and die camp. And this was confirmed for me when I was working as a youth ministry intern. I had the, the great fortune. <laughs> it's true. 
I had the great fortune of taking a group of students up to the Boundary Waters to go camping. So I, at the ripe old age of 23, one of my youth is actually over here, she's in ministry now and she's laughing at me. At ripe old age of 23, I was entrusted with a group of students with just one other adult, a dad whom we affectionately called MacGyver because he could make a bear trap out of a toothpick and a little piece of twine and a stick of gum, right? This was the guy you wanted in your group. Well, one night, we all had to go to sleep early. We all had to retreat into our tents because mosquitoes the size of bats were hunting in such numbers that the hum was audible. It was an oppressive force. And so we sought refuge in our tents. It was still light out, but you know what? We went to sleep anyway because what else are you supposed to do? So I was in a tent with all of the girls and then a couple of feet over from me was a tent with the boys. And then above us, a little ways away, was MacGyver, a.k.a. Cliff, who had his own tent with his dog. So we were sleeping, and dark, the dark had finally settled in. And all of a sudden, I am roused from my sleep by the sound of a youth calling my name. Jennifer! Jennifer! What? Well, this youth continued his whisper yell. I think that there's something outside of our tent. I think that something has pulled up our tent stake. He was scared. And I could tell he was scared. And that made me scared, which meant that my brain went to the most likely scenario that could ever happen, right? There was a serial killer outside of the tents, and he was just sitting there waiting. And whoever came out first, that was going to be the person who died, right? That's what was going to happen. And that's when it hit me. I was an adult. <laughs> I was an adult. I was supposed to be responsible. I had to do something. These children's lives were in my hand. And so I leapt into action and I called out for the dad, Cliff! <laughs> but there was nothing. And by this time, all of our youth were awake too, right? So we call out again, Cliff! And then it hits all of us. There is silence. The dog is not snoring. The dog always snores. <laughs> Suddenly, my serial killer theory seemed so much more real. <laughs> and so I had another brilliant thought. I had all of the youth call out for him, Cliff! And he woke up. And without a second thought, not a second thought, I tell you, he unzips his tent and he walks out. And I think, oh my gosh, I should probably do the same thing because I'm the other adult on this trip. I'm the paid staff member. If he's going out, I've got to go out too, right? So I did. After I waited a second and made sure that he was not dead. <laughs> Went outside. There was nothing there. The tent stake was still firmly in the ground. So we all look at this student and he looks back at us and he says, what? I thought that there was a bear. A bear? Russ, I know how to deal with a bear. Why didn't you say that? The whole situation confirmed for me that I am not the approach a disastrous situation with creativity type. I am the approach a disastrous situation with terror type. And the truth is, that is probably not going to change for me. Realistically, when it comes to these sorts of immediate life or death, fight or flight situations where your brain chemistry kicks in, that there's not a lot that we can do to control our reactions to those sorts of situations, right? Yet, sudden disastrous death is not the only or even the most common kind of death that we might face in our lifetime. We are much more likely to face the longer term types of dying that come with things like the loss of a relationship or the aftermath 
of suffering through a traumatic situation, or even dealing with the decline of a church or a denomination. And we all know that people respond to these longer term kinds of death in different ways too. There are the people who say, we're not gonna make it. We're not gonna make it. I don't know about you, but I've got a couple of those in my congregation, right? I think we all have one or two. And then there are the people who find a way to say, maybe this is an opportunity. Hey, maybe there is something good and new and creative that could come out of all this. My hunch is that that was true for the Israelites in exile as well. I'm guessing that there are those people who said, we're not going to make it out of this. We're not. Our nation is done. Jerusalem is destroyed. There is no coming back from this. We can never be a nation again. God has left us. Sort of like that person in your church or in our denomination who no matter how hard we might try to ignore them is still there who says with a shake of their head and a very sad voice, the church is dying. The church is dying. Those people, those voices, they're going to continue to talk to us. But in Israel, there were also the people like Isaiah and Jeremiah who said things like, bloom where you are planted. Seek the welfare of the city where you are. Have hope that God is doing a new thing, that the Lord is going to work with us still and has not abandoned us and there will be something new that comes out of this. And I think that that's why I find the juxtaposition of Isaiah 34 and Isaiah 35 so interesting, so compelling. They address two completely different people, the nations, Edom, the enemies of Israel, and then Israel themselves. And they offer two very different portraits of the barren, deadly wilderness. The portrait in Isaiah 34 is terrifying. It is replete with hyenas and jackals, and my personal favorite, the goat demon. <laughs> yeah, what wilderness is not complete without the goat demon? By contrast, the portrait in Isaiah 35 is hopeful. It's even beautiful. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. It shall blossom abundantly like the crocus. In the first, terror is intertwined with the destruction of Edom, the destruction of the na nations, like the nettles and the thistles and the thorns growing over the strongholds and the fortresses of the land. Fear chokes the inhabitants, and they are doomed. In the second, it feels like it is the blossoming of hope that is actually what transforms the landscape. It's almost as if the narrator is saying, there is death in the wilderness, and then there is death in the wilderness. Death, the ultimate death, and the terror that leads to it is what happens to our enemies, or at least we hope it does. Death, transformative death, and the hope that leads to rising is what happens to us. It's almost as if the narrative is saying, you get to choose how you frame your experience of death in the wilderness. It is either going to destroy you completely or it, is e or it is going to lead you to something completely new. Friends, what if we took that choice seriously here and now in our churches, in our denomination, in our own lives, in our country? What if we decided to reframe the death and the wilderness moments in our lives that we all experience? What if instead of approaching them with fear, we approach them with hopeful creativity, with the trusting in the promise and the power of the resurrection? Well, I imagine that this kind of reframing might lead us to say to that person in our congregation or in our denomination who says that the church is dying, I imagine it might lead us to say back to them, not, no, it's not, not, I don't want to hear it, but instead, thanks be to God. The church is dying. 
thanks be to God. As a pastor, those words feel really odd coming out of my mouth, especially at a national gathering. It is almost as if I have been conditioned to think that they are somehow sacrilegious. It is almost as if I have been conditioned to think that church death and resurrection are somehow counter to the gospel that I seek to proclaim every week. But what if this kind of reframing is exactly what we need as a country, as a denomination, as a church, as a people? Approaching the death and the wilderness periods in our life in this way grants us an incredible amount of freedom, right? Instead of clinging to existence as it was, we can embrace death as the transformative pivot to something new, to something beautiful, to new life. The church is dying. Thanks be to God. When that becomes our refrain, when our mindset about this kind of death changes, it allows us to ask an entirely different set of questions. Questions like, what are we dying to? What are we dying to? What does death offer us the opportunity to walk away from? What is so important to who we are? that we cannot imagine walking out of the tomb without it. What is central to our identity? What is not? What is the Holy Spirit doing among us to fashion us anew? The church is dying. Thanks be to God. The truth is this reframing, this questioning, is an integral part of what we do at this conference every year, right? But what does it look like in practice? What is the freedom that it gives us? Well, as we always say, this is going to look different in every context, but I have two examples that might ignite your imagination a little bit. Reverend John Smith, who spoke earlier at one of our testimonies this morning, is a colleague of mine here in the presbytery, and he has been a font of wisdom for me. He shared with me that there was a time in the life of his congregation that was a wilderness time. It was a time when they had a beloved former pastor, as so many churches do, And that beloved former pastor was getting ready to leave. And that can be devastating. I'm sure most of us know that, right? It can be devastating to have a beloved pastor leave. It's the kind of transition that leads to that long-term grief-driven death, or at least it can. And so the session had a choice. The session could either look at this as the end, right? This was death. This was terrible. They were going to decline without this pastor. Or they could look at it as an opportunity. Well, the session chose to look at it with creativity. The session chose to say, what if, what if we redid the way that we, we worked as a session? What if we took on more responsibility? What if we were the leaders in the absence of a strong pastoral presence? And that's what they did. And the church flourished in this time. They even added another worship service. And I can imagine them asking questions like, what does it really mean to be a session? What does it really mean to be a spiritual leader in the church? Not just polity-wise, though we love it. (laughs) What does it really mean? What does it look like to be a church without a strong pastoral leader? Is it possible that a church without a strong pastoral leader could flourish? but maybe don't tell our denomination that sometimes, right? What is central to who we are as a congregation and how do we perpetuate that? Choosing to see opportunity gave them the freedom to try something totally new when it came to leadership. The church is dying. Thanks be to God. In my context, it looks entirely different. As I said, I'm the pastor of a very small church. We are going through redevelopment, and if any of you are in that boat, it is messy. It is hard, and you never know how it's going to end. We do not know how it's going to end. But approaching this wilderness period with excitement and creativity has given us the opportunity to ask some really interesting questions. Like, oh, I don't know, what if we brought the circus arts into our worship services? Well, some people here found out today, it's awesome. It is a lot of fun. And, And the congregation loves it. 
What if we tried to start an after-school program with our local elementary school? Well, after a disastrous failure of a year, it's flourishing too. We have relationships with kids that we have known now for four years. And what if we then decided that we would, might try to run a summer camp for those kids, even though we only have five congregational volunteers who could feasibly staff that camp? Well, thinking outside of the box in partnership with the center, we have made that camp happen for the last three summers running. And it is amazing. And then the question, what if we invited those kids to start coming to worship with us once a month and then said that they could stay afterwards to make slime because apparently that's the best thing on the face of the planet if you're in fifth grade, yes? Yes, slime, your favorite? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Slime's the best. What if we did that? Well, if we did that, we would find that we suddenly had a youth group that wanted to be with us every single Sunday of the month, which we do not have the staff for. That's what we would find. What if we decided to um, fundraise via grants? Because our congregational giving is pretty flat and it's probably not going to get better. Well, the honest truth is that's been a mis mixed bag. But we have learned a lot through the process. Facing this wilderness, this long-term death with creativity, has given us the freedom to say the church is dying Thanks be to God. The church is dying. Thanks be to God. Friends, as Christians, the promise of the resurrection frees us to approach death in the wilderness with hope and with creativity and maybe even with sparks of joy in the midst of the fear and the anxiety that we are sure to feel. The promise of the resurrection frees us to reframe death in the wilderness and to ask the important questions that lead us to new risks and to new life. The promise of the resurrection allows us to find ourselves in the narrative of Isaiah 35. The cracked walls and the empty pews shall be glad. The stragglers of a congregation shall rejoice and feel new life. Like a new worshiping community, they shall serve and they shall rejoice abundantly and with singing. The glory of being relevant to their neighbor shall be given to them. The majesty of living out the love of the gospel. Strengthen the weary elders, make firm the feeble volunteers, say to those who are a fearful fearful heart, do not be afraid. Here is your God. Christ is coming with resurrection. The Spirit is coming with transformative fire. So let us all say the church is dying. Thanks be to God. The church is dying. Thanks be to God. The church is dying. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. For that means that a new church is rising.